Good afternoon folks, welcome back to Higher Chemistry. Uh, a special hello to the Rentons across the road who make a comment about the fact that I have a clamp stand in my windowsill. Which is true, I do. It's part of this video studio. It's an incredibly high-tech piece of equipment that I use to hold my phone to record this. Uh, let's have a look at chromatography today. Guys, we're using all the colours of course. Um, chromatography. What's that R doing in there? Honestly. I, I'm going to say that that could have been a deliberate mistake to help you see what the point of chromatography is, but it wasn't. I just can't spell. SQA, page 99. Now, it does say specifically on the SQA document that you're not required to know the details of any technique. So why am I bothering to make a video on it? Because it's asked almost every year in some fashion. And I'm going to outline two favourite uh, chromatography techniques, both of which cover the learning outcomes here. Let's have a look at paper chromatography first, which is probably one of the oldest ones. You can actually do this at home if you fancy a shot at it, piece of cake. We take a paper, a sheet of filter paper, basically. You can also get special chromatography paper. Um, it is dipped into a solvent. Um, there's a baseline drawn in graphite. I wonder if you could figure out why graphite's a good one. Wait and see how the rest of the video goes and come back to it. Baseline drawn in graphite here. And then on the graphite, you will have a sample. Now, what is the point of chromatography? The point of it is it's used to separate complicated mixtures of chemicals. I probably should have said that at the start. I'm an idiot. Uh, how does it achieve this black magic of separating uh, chemicals? One of two ways. It's either based uh, on the polarity of the molecules in the mixture versus the polarity of the solvent um, that you dip it into. Let's do our solvent in blue today. Um, so there's our solvent there, which you notice is actually under the baseline. Don't put the baseline into the solvent, otherwise you screw up the experiment. So this solvent here will have a certain polarity. It doesn't have to be water. Um, it can be a whole bunch of things. And the molecules in here will have a certain polarity. And depending on how close a match the polarity is here and here. If it's a very good match, then as this liquid soaks up the paper, which it will by capillary action, you'll end up eventually at the end of the experiment with the solvent line up here. If the polarity of these molecules matches quite closely the polarity of the solvent, then these molecules will love to dissolve in the solvent and it will get dragged up the paper quite high up, possibly right even up into the line. If on the other hand, the polarity of the molecules in your sample is very different from your solvent, then they won't budge an inch. They'll just say, no, thank you very much. I don't want to dissolve in you. Because, of course, like dissolves like. Go back and have a look at my other video. If I remember, I'll try and put a link somewhere up here, probably, um, to go to that video based on polarity and solubility. Um, so this is paper chromatography. So you put your blob of your sample here. So we'll call this sample. Uh, and as I said, it separates. So with a bit of luck, you'll find that your... I'll just juggle this pen. You'll find that your sample will separate out into quite a few blobs. The number of blobs corresponds to the number of substances that were mixed up in this sample. These will sort of separate out as they spread up the paper. You should go and try this. I'll explain how to do it at the end. It's great fun. Now, that in itself doesn't tell us anything. Um, but let's just say we're t testing a drugs sample here. Uh, along the bottom here, we will also put blobs of known drugs. Uh, let's do them in different colours. Why not? Because we can. Chromatography, by the way, is Greek for writing with colour. Uh, chroma as in colour and graphy as in writing. So let's test some drugs here. Let's go with uh, cocaine. Um, and black. Let's have... LSD, probably not used much, it's showing my age, MDMA, that's probably more like it, um, and let's have some um, morphine, not actually a drug as such, some medicine, I know, let's just say an opiate. Okay, so these will also spread up the paper, let's just say the opiate spreads up to there. Let's say the MDMA spreads up to here. And let's say the cocaine ends up here. Now, the way we read these chromatographies, these paper chromatograms, 
is you read along horizontally. So I'm hoping you can see that that height there is about a match for that height there. So I would say, yep, that sample had some of this chemical in it. There is not a match for that height, so probably not. Uh, this one here doesn't really match up to anything, so we still don't know what that one is. This one here also does not match up to anything height-wise. This, though, yeah, there we go. So that's a yes for that one, and a yes for that one. They were in the sample. That's how you do paper chromatography. Uh, quick recap, as I said, it's based on polarity, where you're comparing the polarity of the samples, the molecules, sorry, in your sample, versus the polarity of the solvent that you have chosen to use. If in reality you did this and found your blobs did not move off the baseline, then change the polarity of this. If you find all your blobs go to the top and still don't separate, you're still doing it wrong. Uh, the second thing that the SQA want you to be aware of a method of separation is not polarity, it's actually molecular size. That's a very different uh, type of chromatography, but it still enables you to separate complicated mixtures, so it's still chromatography. Let me just pause this and I'll try and draw as best I can the setup and how that runs. Okay, um, this is a technique called gas chromatography. There's a whole bunch of them, not always using gases, but basically this is an interesting one because it has an extra degree of, it's two extra degrees of complexity compared with um, paper chromatography. Paper chromatography just basically tells you what's in your sample and it usually just relies on polarity. This other method, gas or HPLC, if, there any, if there's any uh, analytical chemists out there watching this, I apologize for massively oversimplifying this, I know. Um, you've got a mobile phase, which in this case is a gas, it's sort of ish like a solvent, solventish. You fire your sample in, it gets caught up with the gas, it passes through this column, which is coiled up inside a box at a constant temperature. Uh, and the column is filled with a second phase, that's a solid phase. Don't worry about it. Uh, basically, what happens is, if you have your sample with, say, 10 different chemicals in it, once again, they will all split up in here. Some of them will be flushed through with the gas very quickly. Some of them will love to stick to the solid and will take a long time, comparatively speaking, to come out and be detected here by this detector. Uh, and it, the time that it takes to go passing through this equipment depends on two factors. Now, it can, once again, depend on polarity compared to the solid and the gas for your sample molecules, but it can also depend on molecular mass. The size of the molecules now has an effect on how quickly uh, molecular size um, they will get flushed or mass through here. Smaller molecules tend to pass through faster. Bigger molecules, as you might expect, will tend to take longer to work its way through this solid here and then be detected. Uh, now, I showed you how to read a paper chromatography. It just looks like that. That's your finished product, basically. I don't suppose I've got any here. I did a couple last year and brought them home to show you. Um, what does a gas chromatogram output look like? It's a bit more technical, but it has the second thing. Remember I said there were two differences? Well, that's the first difference. Molecular size now has an effect. And also this, although it's harder to read, is the total business because now you've got intensity, which is the intensity of the signal that the detector picks up against time, effectively. Uh, and you'll get a series of spikes of intensity versus time. Uh, and your output looks something like this. Now, this is just the business because instead of just telling you that the chemical is present, now, if you have a look at the area under these peaks, you can actually tell how much chemical of this there is relative to the other chemicals. That's nice. I suppose maybe in paper you could look at how dark the blob is and that would give you an indication, but this gives you an absolute number on it, which is brilliant. So um, either going by the height here, I just realized I slipped into advanced higher mode there, sorry. Um, you can either judge the intensity by the height or by the area under the curve. That's actually, oops, sorry, that's something called NMR for next year. Come back next year and learn more. Um, let's just go with the height. That's a simple version. 
and the time that it takes for each peak. Well, if you know the temperature, you can flush through pure chemicals, you can time how long it takes them to come out uh, into the detector, so you know exactly what time a, a given chemical takes to pass through this system. All you do is let the computer tell you, and you can replace times with names of chemicals. Uh, MDMA, cocaine, opiates, and forgotten what the other one was. There wasn't a third one. It was... Um, these have all come from this sample, for example. And I think that's about it. Let me just check that I haven't missed anything. Nope, that's it, folks. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, on the basis of chromatography today, two different methods. You, do you need to know these methods? No, no, you don't need to know those methods. But as I said, you need to know the ideas behind them. Uh, these typically crop up in problem-solving questions. Um, I've seen, for example, I've seen a problem-solving question once before where a spike on here went like that. It was actually cut off. So in other words, it was too intense for the machine to measure. The intensity went right up to 100% here and then topped out. So to get a true indication of how much chemical there really was, what you should, of course, done is either use a smaller quantity of sample here, reduce the sample, or dilute the sample. Uh, if you dilute the sample by a factor of 10, say, for example, and then you only get a signal that goes here now, now you can read the height and multiply it by 10, and that would have told you how much was in your original sample. But we're wandering very close to volumetric analysis here in titration, and I've already done that. Um, so thanks for listening, folks. Just a quickie today. Bye-bye.